Good morning and welcome to our lesson today entitled Watch for Christ's Return. And we'll be looking today at scriptures again from Matthew. This is the 24th chapter, beginning with verses 23 through 32. Every year in December, we celebrate the coming of Jesus when he came as an infant. And on the year that he arrived, there were very, very few people aware of his arrival at that time. And we know the shepherds were advised and they came by. But this was almost a non-event as far as most people were concerned. Now, when you look at the next end of this thing, Jesus' second coming will not be anything like the first. As a matter of fact, there will be no mistaking, no misunderstanding what this event is. Everyone will know it. Now, you might say, well, how's that going to happen? Excuse me. He's going to return, and we will all know this. And so uh, we need to look at the, the things that Jesus had to say here in this session, and then we'll proceed a little further. Verse 23 says, If anyone tells you then, see, here is the Messiah, or over here, this is where the Messiah is, don't believe it. For the false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. Why? Well, to lead people astray, if possible. Even the elect. Interesting. We'll pursue that a little bit. Verse 25 says, Take note, I have told you in advance. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles often warned against counterfeit prophets. The writings of Jewish historian Josephus mentioned several pretenders. There was a fellow named Theda, Theudas. He lived between A.D. 44 and 46 and claiming during this period of time that he would divide the Jordan River just like Joshua did and reconquer the promised land and get it back from the Romans. What happened? Well, the Romans army got rid of him. Then there was a fellow named Manahem ben Judah from 64 and 66, and he actually laid siege to Jerusalem. And then he was assassinated by Thela the Zealot. In our time, for those of the old timers, in 1975 to 2010, there was a South Korean preacher. He made the preposterous claim to be the Lord of the Second Advent. Now, what this means, according to him, was Jesus died prematurely, and as a result, uh, he's come back to finish what Jesus started. And he claimed that the, uh, he just failed on his mission, and this fellow kept this, and many Koreans and some Americans, and they got on to this notion, well, this may well be true. He died about a decade ago. Uh, we haven't heard anything about him or since then. And, but there are still some Koreans and some Americans that still believe this is possible. It seems difficult to imagine that false messiahs and prophets could counterfeit signs and miracles. However, the scripture is warned that Satan and his demons can seemingly do such marvel and fool people. Today, we have the New Age movements, we have the atheists, we have Buddha statues, and we have signs of the zodiac 
It's worn as jewelry. So uh, we, we can carry these good look charms around as we do. Now, on Easter Sunday, the atheist gathered in Atlanta for, uh, I guess, a convention or whatever their meeting was on Easter Sunday. And the atheists comprise approximately 4% of our population here in America. Uh, this has doubled in the last couple of years, or the last 10 years at least, because before that, only 2% of people claimed to be atheists. Now, in addition to these 4% atheists, there are 5% agnostics. And so that means one out of every 11 people, they don't believe there's a God. They don't accept that at all. And so uh, they're just sort of left out in the cold. Now, I don't know whether you have ever been to a funeral of someone that you knew was not a Christian, but it's a rather uncomfortable situation to be in because for that person, Whatever they expected, perhaps, in their, the minds of others of the same thought pattern, they will be okay. But the good book tells us that unless we accept Jesus as our Savior, we will not be entering eternity and destined to paradise, heaven, as he's going to prepare a place for us. So uh, there's still a lot of folks around that, that don't think there is a Christ. Verse 26 says, so if they tell you, see, he's here in the wilderness, you don't have to go out. Now, why would they think uh, he's in the wilderness? A lot of people believe that John the Baptist was actually a leader from God who could well have been the Messiah. He was the one that was out in the desert. He ate locusts and honey. And I have to chuckle. Uh, I probably could do all right with honey. I'm not sure how I'd go about digesting those locusts, though. And I, I don't know whether you have to close. I, I'm sitting here making fun of him, I guess, in a way because I don't understand that, but that's what he lived on. And so that's why folks thought, well, you know, when, when Jesus comes back, when the Messiah comes, he may well come in the desert. Now it says, well, there'll be some who say he's in the storerooms. Well, why would they say that? Because there are people that believe that Jesus was hidden away, and someday he'll come out of this hiding place, wherever that might be, and then we'll, we'll know everything's going to be okay. Well, that's not true. The Bible doesn't say anything at all about that. And so Jesus said, don't believe it. Verse 27 says this, For as the lightning comes from the east, and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will gather. Hmm. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will not far fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, this is kind of interesting. We say that we'll be shaken. This world shakes when we have earthquakes, doesn't it? Uh, this is in the powers of heavens will be shaken. That may be true. It may also be a rumbling. We, we cannot be real sure what this means. 
we can look forward to Christ's return, but we don't have any idea where it is. Like Jesus didn't even know. There's only one that does know, and that's God himself. Now, Jesus uses some ideas taken from Isaiah. And it says that we need to do things in keeping with the Bible. At that time, Jesus used much of the Old Testament. And so we're told that he's going to prepare a place for us. In fact, he's doing that right now. And <clears throat> we will be giving uh, rooms. I always like the word mansion in that song. I've got a mansion over the hilltop. Jesus is going to prepare a special place for you and for me, for those of us that believe in him. And it'll be like nothing that we've ever seen before. And <clears throat> what are we going to be doing? Well, we are going to be enjoying the fellowship with Christ. Uh, I told Mary this this week, we were chatting a little bit, and I said, do you remember we had a young evangelist come to our church in Cliftondale some years ago, many years ago, in fact. Uh, he was, he'd was he been to seminary, but he, he was preaching, and he said, now, you folks think we get to heaven, we're going to be eating corn. That's, that's not true. I mean, we're not going to be eating anything. And so I'm sitting there thinking, well, hmm, how much of the Bible have you skipped over? Jesus, his life was not much different than ours. When he got together with folks, they had food. Yeah, he fed 5,000 men and probably another 10,000 women and children. And he, he didn't do it once. He, he fed 4,000 the next time. Whenever he got together the last time with his disciples, what did they do? They had a meal, the Last Supper, it was called. They enjoyed a meal together. What happened when he arose? We can picture him, according to the Bible, standing on the seashore, preparing breakfast for those disciples that were out there in the fishing boats. He was taking fish and baking it, for them, and he also had bread going. So, friends, I think we can be pretty well assured that we're going to be having some good stuff to eat when we get to heaven. Now, <clears throat> everybody's given certain gifts, but I think God probably looked at a lot of these Southern Baptist women we've got, and he said, you know, your, your primary job's going to be casseroles because we got some buttes going. And I chuckle at that a little bit, but friends, we've got so much to look forward to in the life after this one. There will be some things that will be familiar, and I think the food's one of them. It'll be different. We know that there was a tree of life in the garden when Adam and Eve lived there, and that we will also have access to that tree of life once we get in paradise and we come with Christ. When is he coming back? Well, we don't know. No one does know. No one that I know knows, or perhaps that you know. Because the Bible says it's not stated. It did say there would be things that would happen. Uh, we've lived through something in this world we never visualized. For two years, we have had this COVID virus amongst us. It is still here. And now the big argument is, do you get a vaccination or not? And so some people are not, and there are still people who are dying because of it. We didn't anticipate this. It just happened. Now, is this a sign? Hmm. Currently, Putin in Russia has decided that he wants to gather in some of the territories that the USSR lost 
And so uh, he has a war going on in Ukraine. And friends, the things we see are they're gut-wrenching, if you'll pardon the expression. I mean, how could this be? I mean, they're, they're killing innocent people. And it makes no difference. And so here we are, we're even being threatened with the nuclear weapons if too many countries don't do their thing and leave Russia alone and continue to allow them to use their oil as a means of uh, sustaining some of their cost. And since many European countries, as well as the US, have decided we're not gonna use any more of it, well then, it's easy for them to threaten us. Can they carry it out? Well, of course they can if they want to. Will they? We don't know. It is an item of concern for me, for you, perhaps. God's gonna take care of it one way or the other. We just don't know which way it is. But I think we can probably come to the realization that perhaps somewhere and all the things going on in our world today, it's time that is drawing near for the return of Christ. I couldn't help but be amused at something I saw on Facebook today from a very dear friend of mine who made this statement. He said, it's interesting that a 19 year old can forego their college debts and have a lawsuit that claims they didn't understand that they were this loan had to be repaid for their education. While on the other hand, a four-year-old is able to decide which sex they want to be a part of. Think about that for a little bit. I couldn't, I, I just looked at it and I thought, you know, he's right. We have so many things in this world today that are different, that are confounding many of us. It's like, what are people thinking? We have people like the atheists. They don't care. They are living for their own things. Uh, we have so-called, I guess, Christian things like the New Age group. But their ideas are, they're not necessarily scriptural. Some may be. But it's as though they're saying, well, look, you do all these good things and you'll be taken care of. That's not true. God gave each one of us grace. When we accepted Christ, he blotted out all of our sinfulness. And the Bible says he he buried them in the deep blue sea. That's one quote. Another was that he put them as far as the east is from the west. If you started going east, you'd never get there. If you started going west, you'd never get there. That's how far away our sins are from what we've done because God forgave us. I had a, a learned friend some years ago who said, well, you know, Judgment Day, uh, we're going to be accountable for everything we've ever done. Friends, that's nonsense. Everything that God has forgiven you and me for will not be a subject. God will look at what we've done with the gifts he's given us. What does that mean? It means that if he gave you certain gifts, that he's going to look at how well you use them. And that's what you will be judged on. Now, you won't be kicked out of heaven if you didn't use one of them. You'll be there. But the reward you get, that's what's going to be missing because you will not get some of the awards that others will. You and I have responsibilities to live a Christian life. It's not easy. And there are still many things that drag us away from that. But we're still responsible to do that and to do it to the very best of our ability. Now, what's gonna happen 
in the years to come. Well, we have an opportunity, all of us do, regardless of your age, we have an opportunity to still be God's servants and to use the skills that he gave us. There are a couple of folks on my prayer list every day that I give thanks for, and, and I ask God to, to continue them and give them a good long life and help them in any way that they need it because they have used their time, their energy, their money, their effort, their home to provide for other people. I have witnessed it and I have experienced it. And then I look at folks in, in my own Sunday school class and my own level of acquaintances and I see the same thing over again. People who took a back seat perhaps in doing things, but who came to serve others. And one of the things that's most memorable to me is some of the wonderful people that step up and do the thing that helps other people when we have services after we've had a funeral. It's, it's so wonderful that some people will stand up and place the tables and the chairs out and then take them down. It, and, and ladies who prepare wonderful things and distribute them and see that everybody's taken care of. These are gifts that God gave to people. And I am so blessed in knowing several of these people. And, and I, I think that God is going to bless these folks real good. You and I still have responsibilities. I know other folks within my range who use their telephone. They can't get out much, and they don't. But they call people, and they talk with them. And even if you go to visit when they can, and this, and this is a gift that is in use. God gave it to this person, and they use it. Some people have difficulty with it. There are certain gifts that are buried. Each one of us have something different. I know people that have a difficult time praying out loud in church. I can't condemn them for that. But I also know they also have some other gifts that they can and do use and use successfully for other people. And I think it is time that each of us take a look at the things God has given us and do the very best we can for him. Not worry so much about when he's coming back, but be concerned about when we be prepared when we sit down with him after he has taken us up to paradise with him, because that's what's going to happen. It is so wonderful to be back with you again today, and I pray that you will give some thought to the words of Jesus that there will be imposters. Uh, they're, they're con men all the time. Many of you get phone calls of people trying to mess you out of something you have. Same's true with the end of time, so to speak. We'll know when Jesus comes. We will know who it is. And we're going to be blessed abundantly. There is little doubt in my mind. Heavenly Father, until we meet again next week, we pray that you'll take each one of us, help us with the special situations that each one of us face, help us to cope with them. Your word says you will stand by us and with us, and we know you will. And we pray that you'll help us make the road a bit easier, fewer curves and uphills and downs, Lord, and bless us in the ways that you always do. And we're grateful for that, and we're grateful for your Son, Jesus. And we're grateful for the Holy Spirit who rests with us when we accepted us, our Savior, as Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen. See you next Sunday.